Well, hi, everybody. I'm Rick Dancer. Welcome to Get Real with Rick Dancer. And tonight on this episode, <laughs> this is one of those, um, another one of those weird Oregon stories that will just blow your mind. And I heard about it from my friends here in Montana who came up and said, did you hear that in Oregon, they're giving $30,000 to illegal people, people here illegally um, for their for a house payment? And I was like, what? And then I started getting news articles about it because this blew up. And now there's some backpedaling going on by all the people putting these out. But it was your some of your legislators, not all of them, but some of your legislators who came up with this whole idea. So, yeah, if you're one of those people struggling and you're you, you know, you need to buy a house, you're looking to buy a house and you're a legal citizen of the state of Oregon. Pfft, SOL on you. It doesn't matter. So we're going to go through that with a representative from Oregon uh, House District number 17. Ed's going to be with us in a second. First, though. <laughs> Dr. Michael Bratlin, this is a story that he would love to be a part of <laughs> having this on. This is why he sponsors us, because he thinks what we do is important. He thinks it's important. People have a voice and we are really anti-censorship. And also Albert Taylor, Endless Possibilities. They work with people with disabilities in our community. If you're looking for work, something that's meaningful, something that you come home at night and you feel like you really did something for someone in the world. There you go. Also, Greg Hinkle, new American funding here in Helena, Montana. He can help you put together mortgage plans for Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana. He does live here in Montana. Uh, he moved here the same reason I did. <laughs> you know why? Because of the topic we're going to be talking about tonight. And Montana Oral Surgery and Dental Implant Centers. They have plant, uh, centers in Butte. They have one in Bozeman, one in Great Falls, and one here in Helena. Um, they're awesome people. If, I know you're not always looking for a root canal, but when you got to have something done, these are the people who will make it painless because they put you out. I like that part. Rain peaking and air conditioning out of Cresswell, Oregon. Uh, winter's coming. And I hear from the Farmer's Almanac, it's going to be a hell of a winter for you guys in Oregon and us in Montana. So get on their plan to have them checking out your plan, what you're doing before your heat pump goes out. When it's, when it's 20 below and the heat pump goes out, that's not a good day. Mm -mm. And Matt McCarl, New Leaf Hyperbarics and Wellness Center out of Eugene, Oregon. They do uh, hyperbarics. They also do light therapy, massage, and a whole bunch of other stuff that uh, will blow your mind. So awesome people. All right, let's get right to the topic. Ed Deal, representative from Oregon House District Number 17. Um, Ed, this is just one of those stories that it just keeps getting weirder. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if the, no, the Democrats okay. want to talk about weird, this is weird. Yeah. Tell me about it. I, I don't know. There's a nonstop supply of this stuff in Oregon. So <laughs> I, I know I'm doing measure 118. Uh, next oh week man. Yeah. To, to push yeah. out for people. Cause that's an even crazier, but that I, the funny thing about that one is I, I Tina Kotek, your governor finally disagrees with it. She's, she's against it. It's like, oh my God, how, what, what, what happened? I know we've got Democrats, Republicans, unions, businesses, and the it's governor like, all, all opposed, all aligned like, to oppose major 118. It's like what Oregon used to be like. <laughs> okay. So talk, let's talk about this. Yeah. How, how this works. Cause people in, in other parts of, you know, first of all, a whole bunch of people in Montana, Idaho, places like that are all going, <clears throat> is this for real? Now the Oregonians are yeah. already up to speed. They know how crazy this is, but I think a lot of Oregonians did not know this was going on. No, they didn't. And so this all stemmed from a bill that was passed in 2022. I'm a new legislature legislator. I discovered it in 2024 when uh, representative Janelle Bynum introduced a bill to add more funding to it. And this, this program is called the Economic Equity Investment Program. Equity. Mm. And, and the co equity, as you'll soon discover, is code for discrimination. Yeah. And equal and, if you're a part of a certain yes, group. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's equal, except some are more equal than others. So what does this do? So the, the EEIP program is designed to provide money to, in theory, people who have 
been systemically discriminated against. And really to make the idea is to make up for past sins. Okay. The, that works so, so well. Yeah. So in 2022, the legislature passed this bill, put $15 million into it. And in 24, they added another 8 million. So it's 23 million. Um, and the criteria you, you have to meet like two of the five criteria to be part of this program. You have to be uh, sh demonstrate discrimination based upon your race and based on the testimony and everything. What that means is you're not white and you self attest that you've been discriminated against. So you don't have to prove it. No, no. You uh, another criteria is some language other than English is spoken in the home. Another criteria is uh, quote unquote, what they it says citizenship status, and what that's defined as by the state for terms of this agreement is you're not a U.S. citizen or you're a tribal member. So this is targeted for people who are here illegally. Well. Legally or illegally, non-U.S. citizen, they could be here legally. Okay, but there's no criteria. You have to have. Uh, so you could be ID. here. You could be here illegally and yeah. qualify for this loan. You, you have to have a tax ID number. There's no requirement for you to be here legally to have a tax ID number. So, um, and then then uh, there's a couple other criteria that you could meet based on your income level, and uh, there's also a Kind of one of the other options is if you live in a rural area or your business is in a rural area. So how did this just hit the headlines? Because I was getting well, hit by people in Montana. Oh, yeah. about it. That's how I found so, out. They're going, What the hell do those people in Oregon think? So I've been fighting this since I learned about it early this year. And I'd love to talk to you about that whole yeah. escapade. But um, what happened is uh, this group called Hacienda CDC broadcast out to a to a circle of counselors i believe that hey we have this home mortgage program that will re reimburse thirty thousand dollars for someone buying a new home they have to have a qualified mortgage and they cannot be u.s citizens oh. and so so what happened is so that came out uh an associate of mine oregon citizen uh, discovered this. She she posted about it on social media. I reached out to her and said, "Hey, that that program is from this EEIP program, which I've been fighting since I learned about it in February." So uh, we connected with the Daily Caller. The Daily Caller published an op-ed for us that the Oregonians been sitting on for eight weeks now. Well, of course, not run it. I. I put this op-ed together with an attorney group, Pacific Legal Foundation, because we we agree this this program is inherently discriminatory. So we put a very thoughtful op-ed together. Oregonian wouldn't touch it. So, but Daily Caller said yes, we'll run that. And then we spent an hour on the phone with a great journalist, Mary Rook. She really dug into this, and she did an article in the Daily Caller about this program, the EEIP is specifically the Hacienda program. And then it went viral. Yeah. I mean, it went all around the world a few times because people are rightly outraged. I, I had, I've had so many people reaching out to me that, what, what are you talking about? This, this is outrageous. Well, think of all the hardworking Oregonians right now who can't yeah. afford a down payment on a house they don't get that. So their tax dollars are going into this program to pay for people possibly who are here illegally yeah. to be yeah. able to buy a house. That's just bullshit. It is I mean, bullshit. It, it is. It is. It and is. it's discriminatory. It's, it's yeah. racist against it anybody who's not. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, so why isn't it? I just, that just, pisses me off because it's like it's so blatantly we talk of equity and equality that this this has nothing to do with that and they're no, trying it, to make it, up for past sins or something and it's like so so you do it at the at, at the at the at the at the, the, at the cost of other people who yes. deserve this more than they do because they live here and pay taxes here it, it it's outrageous and i mean i i've had so many constituents and people 
in the state reach out after hearing about this? You know, is this true? Is this really happening? And I got to say, well, unfortunately, it is. I had a, a constituent in my district, first generation American. His dad immigrated from Mexico. Good. Went through the process legally. He's a successful businessman here. And, but this constituent was pissed. Mm-hmm. He said, You're totally disincentivizing uh, going through citizenship. All the work that we did to become citizens, um, it's just like a slap in the face to them. And uh, so I, you know, so I'm glad that the word got out when, because when I was trying, when I was making an issue of this in February, you know, there, you know, you, you, a few people hear about it, but it almost takes something as egregious as this to finally get people's attention. So, so what, who, who voted? Was this, mo- this was, dem- was it the Democrats that pushed this through? Oh yeah. Yeah. So on, I went back and looked at the original bill in 2022. And I, before I get into it, when I read this, bill, what actually it's law, state law, by the time I saw it. I look at it and I go, if if this person is white and a U.S. citizen living in Portland, there is no way they can qualify it for this this program, even if they're poor. But a minority non-citizen of comfortable means can qualify for this program. I'm not serious. I'm not Another scenario is uh, a white poor rural person um, may qualify, but they'd have to be poorer than a minority in the exact same situation, the way the bill is written and the way the rules are defined for it. It, I, you, I'm not making it up. It, you, you just, it's so outrageous. You go, how in the world did this happen? But it happened on purely partisan lines Nobody, I don't know what was going on in 2022. I don't know if anybody's paying attention, but but in 2024, when the refunding bill came up, I made a stink. I made a stink about it. So, what does that tell you about where Oregon's headed? They, there is, uh, th- Rick. This is the tip of the iceberg in Oregon. There's. We There's need balance. balance. Oregon needs balance. balance. They've cheated. The, the Democrats cheat, and I don't care. I don't care if people can say I'm partisan. I'm not. I'm not even a Republican. You know, I'm a non-affiliated voter. <laughs> but I ran as a Republican once because it's the only way I could get into office. But yeah. I've been a Democrat too. The thing is, it used to be where it was balanced in Oregon, and things happened pretty fairly. But they've redistricted and, and redrawn the lines and cheated with those lines and made it impossible for Republicans to get any territory because because most people in Oregon, the biggest voting block in Oregon is non-affiliated voters. It's not Democrats. It's a huge block. And I, I think a lot of voters just really aren't informed. For example, this program, like I said, has been around since 2022. Nobody raised a, any issue with it until about two weeks ago. And that's because of our efforts to get more public attention on it. So how, you know, and shame on Oregon Live for not, you know, not publishing a Oregonian, you know, for not still publishing. Publish it. They're, still, they're still sitting on it. So it's up to them. <laughs> well, so what do you, what do you plan to do now? So you're new to the well, legislature, right? I'm, I'm new. I'm just, uh, I'm still in my first term. We, you know, we run every two years, so I'm up for reelection working that. But, um, so what what I did, I, I'll tell you what I did. And when I first learned about this in February, it came to my committee. I'm vice chair on the Small Business Econ Development Committee. Janelle Bynum, who's right now running for Congress, uh, she's the chair. So she brings this as a committee bill. And I'm reading the lie that, well, this is this is completely discriminatory. This is racist. And then I, I worked with legal counsel within the building. You know, we have the legislators have access to a nonpartisan group of lawyers and they help us write bills. They review law and things. The state's own legal counsel came back to me with a eight page opinion detailed saying. This is undoubtedly unconstitutional. This bill is unconstitutional. And the reason they're so confident in that is because 
that Supreme Court case, Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard, uh -huh. that case, made it crystal clear you cannot discriminate either directly or indirectly based on race. And with based on the testimony for this bill and everything, it's clearly discriminatory. I sent that legal opinion to Rep Bynum. I get no response. Now tell people who that is so that they're not in your... Yeah. So Janelle Bynum is, uh, I can't remember the House district she represents. She's, she's running for Congress. She's now running for Congress against the incumbent Republican, uh, Lori chavez Dreamer in CD5. So, and she never re responded to the, the fact that this not, attorneys say that this looks like it's uh, yeah unconstitutional. She she didn't respond. Um, I I did reach out to her and speak to her about it, and I discovered that you know she I asked I said, well, this is unconstitutional. She said, do you agree with that? I said, yeah, it's the Constitution. This is reverse racism. She says there's no such thing. Oh, no, that's such horseshit. Yeah. Even, so, even so I, I, I have in the black community who are black. Yeah. Say that. There, uh, there, I know. There is, there is reverse racism against white people. So I uh, I didn't let it go. I I persisted on this. I had our, our Republican committee members write a letter. I eventually ended up in the speaker's office. And uh, Speaker Dan F Rayfield is now run for attorney general. So I'm, I'm there with the majority leader, Fahey, minority leader, Helfrich. And we're having a conversation about this bill. Uh, I make it very clear this, you know, this bill is unconstitutional. When this bill was brought to committee and I wanted an opportunity to ask questions, I was denied the opportunity to ask questions in committee. <laughs> they don't want to talk about this. Thing. No, well, of course not. Yeah. So after my meeting in the speaker's office, they just killed the bill. The bill goes away. I think, okay, great. You know, I, it's done. It's gone. No, what they did is they took the money and they shoved it into this end of session called Christmas tree bill, which is a grab bag of hundreds of line items of projects. Some, some essential like, you know, water treatment, remediation, um, some vital public services. And then the line, I think 482, here's $8 million to refund the EEIP program. They did it because they avoided a conversation in public in my committee on the unconstitutionality and the discriminatory nature of this program. So, so, the, so the program is dead no no so the, the bill they the bill the bill was going to make the reason it was brought as a bill they were going to tweak the language a little bit and refund it add more money to it it's existing law from 22 the program exists by killing the bill and then i'm you know i didn't know it until the very last minute they shoved the money into the into this christmas tree bill just it was a funding bill it had so hundreds of just, items, so just so it's still going to be the program still funded. Oh yeah, and then Hacienda received some of that eight million dollars, and here so, we. Go. So now, what are you going to do? So what I'm going to do? Well, one thing we did do is we we got public awareness of this. Yeah. Oh God, you did a um, good job of that. Yeah. I think Ed, I think Mr. Ed, I think they're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and we did learn yesterday that Business Oregon. Uh, my chief of staff, who's my wife, was investigating this. Business Oregon is now saying on their website that they're revisiting the definition of citizenship status as part of so, their contract. How is Business Oregon involved? That's who has the money. They're the government agency that administers EEIP. Okay, so they're now re-looking at what constitutes yeah. as illegal? They're looking at what constitutes as citizenship status, So, which, which to them meant you're not a U.S. citizen or you're a tribal member. So the agency business Oregon took the grant money and gave a chunk of it to Hacienda. And then Hacienda is distributing it out in $30,000 grants. Okay. So will 
when will you know whether they're going to change that to do you think what they're going to do is take out the illegal if, if you're not here legally <clears throat> then you're not going to get this money because right. i don't think anybody cares if if somebody's if you're, if you're here legally you have every bit as right to to money as anybody else yeah that's i i don't know what they'll do because that was the legislative intent so what do you do at that point? Can you go back? I mean, uh, well, again? I'm going to introduce a bill to repeal the EEIP program. Number one. Now, what does EEIP stand for? Economic Equity Investment Program. What is this hang up on equity? Oh, and it's and what it is is what's so, what's so frustrating, Ed, is it's anything but equity. Yeah. It, in order for them to have equity in their minds, you have to make somebody else unequal. That's exactly right. That is what's going on. It is the definition of discrimination. So I want to repeal the bill, this law in its entirety. Uh, I even introduced an amendment to, to make it so it wasn't discriminatory. They didn't want to hear my amendment even. So I, I just want to eliminate the bill in its entirety. The other thing I'm going to do is introduce a bill that would require the state to look at all statutes passed since 2018 and all agency rules and look for any law or any rule that violates the Equal Protection Clause of the United States Constitution. And I will guarantee you we have hundreds of millions of dollars worth of programs that that are unconstitutional. Some of that money's already been spent. But in Oregon, as a Republican, Republican, what chance do you have of getting something like that passed? Well, given the attention that this got, I think my odds are a lot better. How is it looking for, um, oh, go ahead. You had no more to say. No, this is, well, you've been here. This is just the standard mode of operation. They pass, they'll pass this law. They know it's not constitutional. It goes out there. By the time a, suit, a lawsuit comes up, they're figuring the money's going to be spent. They get their hands slapped. Oh, well, then they do it again. Right. And I can give you some more examples of that. It, it This happens time and time again. So how do you stop this, Ed? How do you stop this? This Because, well, um, because I, I mean, we see this on the national level, too, but we see it. In Oregon, it's just it's it's um, it's it's always been like well, not always, but for the last always, five years, not always. We we were a, you know, really we were a fairly, we we had some progressive things in Oregon. We were a forward thinking state, but it was very much on a bipartisan approach. Yeah. Even when yeah. Republicans were in charge, we passed a a model recycling bill. We passed some some bills that protected farmland. You know. But we've gone from we've gone to the extreme end and well, half the state or at least more than half the state. Well, it seems like, well, it, wouldn't you? Here's another thing. I mean, this is kind of a fun conversation for me. I followed the greater Idaho thing really closely. Yeah, yeah. So Tina Kotek, your governor, has not even sat down with the greater Idaho people. You have a movement where a huge chunk of your state is willing to vote to 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 become part of Idaho and get out of Oregon when those people are more Oregonians than most of the people in the yeah. urban areas. Yeah. These people have land that have been in their families for 150 years, 200 yeah. years. And, and, and they're willing to go to Idaho to be part of Idaho because they're so sick of this kind of crap going on. And the governor won't even sit down. And wouldn't you, if you were the governor and thinking, you know, I, I need to, I've got a problem. I've got a bunch yeah, of kids. you've got a real problem. If yeah, yeah. these and people I, want to leave my state, yeah. I probably should yeah. start listening to someone other than the people that are tickling yeah. my t my ear with their you know little words that make me happy. I don't remember how many counties it is. It's a large number of it counties. Is, it's, I can't remember either. I had them on the last time that we that they passed it, but they've got. I mean, a, a, most of most of the eastern counties, and including Prineville you know, which I can't remember what county, Crook, Crook County. Yeah. But, you know, and that was a tough one because that's a little more getting a little more, you know, liberal. And but they've gotten a, everybody else. I mean, they're, they're, these people have voted and, and it's not to, to leave. It's voted to look into it more. And, right. and even with the studies they've done, um, 
actually Western Oregon benefits from getting rid of Eastern Oregon because you, you <laughs> pay, they pay for them. I mean, the, yeah. the statistics are there. But my point is, you know, the governor and the Democratic legislature doesn't appear to care very much because they don't even address it. And, yeah. and that's how they know how much power they have, that they don't have to pay attention to anybody else. That's how they think anyway. So so this is the deal in Oregon. And this is a warning for Montana. So yeah. like I told you before, I'm from Montana. I grew up in Plains, born and raised. Um, it's a little town. It's a little town. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but Oregon is a very divided state politically. You, you wouldn't realize by what we're doing, but it's very divided. Yeah. Um, but when it goes to the left, it goes hard left because the, the groups calling the shots are on the extreme side. And if if the Democrats don't toe the line on these extreme laws, they will get booted out of office. They will not get their pet bills heard. I mean, it's it's cutthroat. Yeah. So even a moderate Democrat, once they get into that building, they're not a moderate anymore. They That's can't the be. They, they can't. No, be. not on not on the big issues that we care about on some issues. Yes, but not on the big issues that we care about. So. But it's we're talking a few, you know, our the Republican governor lost this state by 40,000 votes. We lost the majority in the House by, I think, 4,200 votes. It's that close. It's that close. So what's the message to Montana? So the message to Montana is it's coming. And it doesn't take much to tip it over the edge. That's the message. So if you if you're in Oregon, we have seen every institution taken over. If you want to save your state, you better get engaged in city councils and school boards at every level of government and other institutions and reinforce them because the stuff is coming. Yeah, I, I think what I always see is once this certain element comes in, it's um, what, what happened in Oregon, I think, and I see that in Montana too, a little bit happening mm -hmm. is the more conservative people, well, well, you know, it's fine. Everybody's just having their conversation. You got to be really careful because it starts with little things. And then all of a sudden, you know, this they, people well, laugh. Yeah. And, and the other question I got a lot, Ed, here when I first moved here is, did you guys really legalize drugs with a measure? Yeah. And I said, yeah, and it sounds crazy and it is, but it's not it, the step from here to here is not that wide. No, it, it's not. Cut it off like this. And I'm not just playing in This isn't about Democrats and Republicans. This is really about that far left agenda that and that, and, 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 and taking over the voice of people who are Oregon is really a purple state. It's an I won when I ran for Secretary of State. Yeah. I won everything but Multnomah, Clackamas, and Washington County, and that's everybody else in the state. I got, I, they, I won their vote, but that those three counties, the biggest counties, that's what runs the whole state of Oregon, and that's what has to change. Well, and I think you know part of our nature is I, I value individual liberty and freedom, and so that that interprets to be tolerance. Right. Okay. Yeah. If you want to do your crazy thing, that's fine. That's your life. Um, but what we've done is taken that to the extreme to where people are finally realizing, hey, yeah, if some guy wants to do drugs, okay, you can say that's that's a personal decision. But you know what? It's destroying my community. Right. It's destroying my business. I can't take my kids to my park anymore. So it's not just a personal decision. And by the way, that that guy's family is destroyed now because of that drug addiction. I just did a podcast with Cottage Grove just before this. I taped oh, it. Yeah. And yeah. they recalled three city councilors because they wouldn't listen to them. And the homeless problem. Yeah. I mean, Cottage Grove is a little, you know, 12,000 person town. And they've got this home, you know, and yeah. they 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 booted them out. And Good. then those got rid of the, I mean, and they're, you know, and yes, it's divided the town, but they're working to try to bring that back yeah. together. But that's what Oregon really needs to do is go. And it's mm -hmm. not to get rid of the democratic voice at all. It's to have, you know, you know, it's, what's really yeah. interesting, Ed, that Oregon's so about equity and equality. Where's the equality in our voice? Yeah. Where's my, when I lived in a district in, in, in Springfield, 
that they redistrict. And I lived in the country. So I was with Cresswell, Camp Creek, where I lived, mm -hmm. Marcola, all these little towns. And then what they did to, to unbalance it is they put me with the University mm -hmm. of Oregon. So my country district was then lobbed into professors, college students and all that. So what happened to my voice? They didn't care about equity in my no, voice. No. It just disappeared. And they did that all over the state. And that's not how you're supposed to redistrict a state. You're supposed to do it fairly. Like the last one who did it fairly was Phil Keesling, Secretary of State, a wow. Democrat, yeah. did it so fairly. And then they blackballed him when he tried to run for governor and the Democrats blackballed him and basically killed his political career. Well, I, I tell you, I saw some of this stuff. I went to college in the late eighties, you know, and I saw some of this crazy stuff. My wife did too. And you think, well, these, these people, once they get out in the real world, they'll get straightened away. You know, these crazy ideas, they're never going to gain traction in the real world. Well, I went out into industry and raised a family, did my thing, made a good home. The people with the crazy ideas, went into government, <laughs> went into these institutions, and now they're calling the shots. Yeah. We have to get involved. And this is not the career path that I chose for myself, but it's either watch my state go into continue into disarray or stand up and push back on this stuff. And I'm encouraging community members. That's what we have to do at every level of our, our government agencies and institutions. We have to do it. So you know what, Ed, really what we're calling for, huh? We're, I think we found some common ground with the yes. far, far left. We <laughs> want equity too. We're we looking do. for we're <laughs> looking for equality. We, we want, want equality. Yeah. We want we want to have our voice heard too. Yeah. And so and and Ed's right. Yeah. And you do that not by necessarily being a state representative or a senator or president, um, the most powerful position you can have is being on the school board yeah. and, and, and the city council yeah. and the county commissioners and getting onto places like that, where you have says a bigger say in a littler place because, yeah. and that's where the power happens. And, and I think people, you know, they, they're tired of it, but yeah, you're right. That's where people need to get involved. And you, you know, got you it. And People tend to get so frustrated with what's going on nationally because you can't control it. So right. I, you know what you can't control? What's going on in your town? Right. What's going on in your school? I remember what's going, going on to... in your life. What's going on in your library? OK, yeah. those things you can get involved in and then expand mm -hmm. your 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 influence from there. And, and I think another theme that's rising just from that Cottage Grove story I just yeah. did, this is all tying in so well, it's kind of funny, but yeah. um, is you, you cannot be afraid of the critics because as soon as you stand up and I'm sure you got it like nothing flat and it's, yeah. it's the names and the labels, those, that's the way that, that a lot of people battle you. And, 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 and you know, and it, once you have, like for me, I've been called so many things that the words don't even matter anymore. You know, because they have no meaning because right. you can't you can't call me a, a a homophobe you can you but i'm not a homophobe i'm not a far-right maga um i'm not a what you know i'm not you know afraid of gay people um you know all the things that they try which that has so much to do with what we're talking with <laughs> you know what i mean that's what yeah. you have to look at how much sense it doesn't make and then you got to just take a stand and speak out and you know, and somebody asked me the other day, when do you do that? I said, if you're at a party and somebody says, oh, I think that's a, you know, measure 110 is a great idea. And you say, well, actually, my uh, really good friend uh, died of a drug overdose. And I think it's a stupid idea. And say that instead of being quiet and biting your tongue. I think too yeah. many people on the more conservative side bite their tongue to get along, especially when you live in Oregon. And it's like we can't have bloody tongues don't do anything. Right. You, you need that sucker wagon a little. Well, that that gets us back to what we need to do about this EEIP program, if I could, Rick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. You so, so getting legislation through, repealing this is got is going to be a big lift. So I left this session this year. What do I do about this? Well, I I get a broad audience, and it went way bigger than I ever thought it would. Good for you. And I, and I get lawyers, and I find plaintiffs. I find plaintiffs, nonprofits who apply for this grant and file a suit because it's discriminatory. Oh. Individuals, individuals that go to the nonprofits that have received the grant, 
apply and are not qualified because it's discriminatory. And so I've got some of that. I'm working on that. But here's here's what happens. We'll get people. I'm, this is outrageous. This is so wrong. I said, would you like to be a plaintiff? Oh, oh, no. You know, I, I can't do that. They're not willing to stick their neck out. Yeah. If you're not going to stick your neck out, nothing's going to change. Right. Exactly. Nobody's coming in to save us on this stuff. It's right. us. And, and don't you think, Ed, like nationally, you kind of see once you start the pushback, it, it's like a steamroller. I mean, yeah. it starts off slow and it's just a few, but pretty soon. And, and there always has to be the, the, the people in the front because somebody like yeah. you to take the hit. But you've taken some hits. Now there's a yeah. it's like that bird thing. You know, now the other people can come in behind you and you get that steamroller going and the geese, you know, you can't. There's, yeah. they can gander. You can be a gander or you can be a goose. <laughs> it's like, uh, I, I think a lot about the emperor's new clothes. Don't you story. worry. Me too. And, and sometimes that's what I feel like that I'm the guy saying, this is complete BS. And no, why is nobody willing to stand up and, and say it? Yeah. And once that happens, I hope it's a cascade of other people being brave enough. And there's a lot of brave people talking about this stuff we just need more of them do you do you think this is a like a test I almost like you know what i mean like that like you know we're to a we're to a place where we as oregonians because i'm gonna still call myself an oregonian yeah. we have allowed apathy to and you know i'm busy with my family i have my job all that kind of stuff that we've if we have our life cut up into sections here's my life my family life my work life my civic life we've let the civic life part slack and you know how many people you know when they give you the numbers on how many people vote in oregon you know how many maybe we should look at how many people don't vote there's, it's like 50 percent. it's like and that's in every state it's there's like, a lot of, yeah there, and there's a lot of to vote don't there's so a then, lot of conservatives that don't vote yeah. And so you are sitting back going, oh, I'm not going to vote. My voice doesn't count. Well, no, you just now what you did is you now made a whole bunch of other voices not count yeah. because it's not exactly. really representing people. That squeaky wheel always gets that that grease and stuff. So what do you so people if you if there's people out there who have done this or you're just saying they can apply for it and become a plaintiff? Yes. If they're willing to put their name out there. And let me give you an example, Rick, of of. Uh, a brave teacher who did this. So uh, earlier this year, uh, a, a teacher in Southern Oregon found out about this grant program that would provide pay for his license renewal. And so like a license renewal and reimbursement. So he applies for the program only to get denied because he's not a person of color. That's the program. You have to be a person of color to get your license reimbursed. So he sues, and as soon as that lawsuit dropped, the state dropped the program like a hot potato. It's gone because they know it's they know it's right. blatantly illegal. Yeah. Wow. And, and there's other programs like that too, Rick. I, I'm going to have be have more coming out relating to education. Okay. Well, Ed, stay in contact with me, and I'll stay in contact with you because. I mean, I think this is this is a great place for Oregonians to get involved and start taking back their government, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I am I am optimistic. I wouldn't be doing this crazy job. I don't really need this. Well, <laughs> I, I'm retired. I was fine retired, but I, I just feel, you know, I have the time and the energy and my wife was willing to jump into this with me uh, to to set our state straight and and give it a fight. And I, I know that we can do it. I know there's enough of us here that we can make this happen. I don't even think it's um, I'm just I'm not trying to correct you, but um, words matter so much and, and use their language. You're just trying to make it equal. Yeah. We're trying yes. to bring equity, equity back to Oregon. I don't use equ equality. Yeah, equal. Exactly. It really is equality. <laughs> yes. I'm trying to bring equality back to Oregon because it's in our constitution and we want to make sure that everybody, no matter what color, I just heard an interview with a guy on uh, Jordan Peterson who wrote a book called um, Colorblind and the pe yeah. people are just 
bashing him for it, but he's really saying, "Oh no, that's we, considered discriminatory." Yeah, he's he's saying we that's that's how it started back in the '60s. Is it was supposed to be that we were colorblind? Martin Luther King talked about being colorblind. Right. And I just talked about that in a post today in response to this EEIP. That's the generation I'm from. Yeah, me too. That's what I grew up with. And when it, you see this, you realize what an outrageous injustice it is. Yeah. But to all people, to all people, all people. Yeah. But the tough part is, Rick, is there are people in the legislature that truly believe that this kind of reverse I, I call it reverse discrimination. They don't call it that, but they think that's okay. Yeah. Uh, Ibram X. Kennedy talks about how to be an anti-racist. He talks about the only way to fix past discrimination is discrimination today in the opposite direction. That's what he says. Well, and I, people and people buy into it. Right. Well, that's yeah. why. God gave us teachers that taught things like critical thinking. <laughs> critical thinking. Yeah. yeah, it's something we need to bring back in our schools. I know. Ed, <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time to talk about this and explain it. And do seriously, keep me up to date on this. And hang on for a second. I'm going to do my out cue. And then um, you've sure. already done this, but I want to give you a couple ideas of people you could go to to help spread this message. I'd love that. And hey, by the way, I was listening to your interview with Jen Hamaker. What a great interview. Thanks. That whole issue with our, our, our forests is one of the reasons I ran. Well, um, watch. So we're doing this series called The Truth About Timber. And um, yeah. we're releasing it. Timber Industry is helping with it. But here's watch this little clip. Okay. Why won't it come up? Hang on just a sec. What's going on here? Huh. Gone through and they have destroyed. I don't know how many little communities are gone. When any of the agencies or any of the industries try to actually do something proactive and try to do something ahead, it's, oh, well, we have to worry about the spotted owl or we have to worry about, you know, the, the marble merlet. How many spotted owls are burned when a fire goes through and burns it? A fire doesn't care if there's a herd of elk in it. A fire doesn't care if there's a marble merlet nest in it or an, a, a, a spot that has to be protected. Fire doesn't care. It's going to destroy it all. Instead of managing the land and actually creating a job and prosperity for small communities, they just have locked it up. And all it is, is it just, they burn it. So people can watch that on rickdancer.com. You can go to YouTube. Anything under Rick Dancer will have that. We're uh, changing the message, the narrative. That's to great. Go back to what, you know, you and I love old growth trees. And, and right now, the biggest threat, according to the conservation people, not the timber industry, although they agree, but according to the conservation people, the biggest threat right now is wildfire. Yes. And we're allowing our forests in Oregon, Washington, Montana, and Idaho to in California, sure. northern to burn up. And yeah. the yeah. and when I was living out in Camp Creek in Springfield, we had got evacuated that on Labor Day, all those horrible fires. They 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 wouldn't go in and do the plans that the BLM has to to thin those forests to protect the spotted owl. And their their lack of knowledge ended up destroying all that spotted owl habitat. So the very thing they were trying to do to protect old growth and spotted owls, they didn't do. Their plan, that their resistance to the plans is what ruined it. So those are anti-timber groups. You and I are environmentalists. We truly we, care about it. That's the other thing. You know, we yep. need to take that back. Yeah, I am. We're the, we're, I'm, I'm on the side of compassion. I'm on the side of environmentalism. Yep. They, they, we've somehow let them take those names over and it's BS. We got to take those names back. Yeah. We're that's, we take it back so and we back. Don't. All right, my man, I will, um, I'll, t I'll talk to you in a, in a few. Hang on just a you second. Bet, Rick. All right. So there you go. You guys, uh, I think Ed's giving you some great advice. That's the facts. That's what's out there. Um, not only is it going to people are designed for people who are not here legally, which is crazy, but it's also designed for people that are um, only with one, you know, who have color skin. 
So if you're white, you're not right. And that's what they're saying. And that's got to change because that's not constitutional. And it uh, doesn't matter what you feel. It's what's real that matters. Uh, share this on your page. Let other people see it. I'm Rick Dancer. Thanks for being with us. Um, we'll see you next time.